Hello listeners, this is Rick Miller back again for another podcast, uh, another episode of the Miller and Everton podcast. And today I have the absolute pleasure of speaking to Mr. Ryan Mitchell Brown. Now, before we uh, get into his journey and let him introduce yourself, just a quick reminder that if you're experiencing that you you love the show, please consider liking, subscribing, and obviously sharing the episode with anybody that you think might benefit. Love you to comment on anything that you've heard today. We do get back to you. So, hey, Ryan, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's great to connect with someone from my motherland, in a sense. So it's pretty, it's pretty great for me. I love talking to people from over the pond. Oh, likewise, likewise. You know, there's there's so much synergy there. You know, even if it goes back, you know, a generation or two. Just tell everybody, like, um, you know, where where your roots are, just so everybody knows. Yeah. So if we if we really want to go back, um, it's actually not too far. I'm I'm technically a second generation American. So my dad's mom is from Sutton area in in London, nice. and uh, his uh, my his my grandpa is actually Canadian. And before that, emigrated from Poland. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty European. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, but I never really, I never really thought about it until I've, I've sort of traveled around and got to meet people from, from over there and sort of connect. And you realize that, oh yeah, a lot of these things that I grew up with, you, uh, you guys also grew up with sort of the same, same ideas around food and just like um, uh, family life and, and things like that. So I have, I have an appreciation for, for like European culture. Um, it's so diverse and I've always been fascinated with it. Um, but that's sort of, yeah, my heritage. I'm definitely like, I don't remember my exact haplotype, but it's definitely Northern European. So I'm one of those, uh, more prone to winter people, I guess. Mm, mm. We'll, we'll definitely get, get into all that around haplotypes for mitochondria later, but uh, just to share mine, I think mine's L from memory. Mm. Um, and it's about, yeah, about 25%. Uh, Southeast Asian. My most of my family is from that part of the world, uh, but Sutton is a is a is a beautiful part of of the UK. So uh, not a bad place to to hail from at all generationally. Um, but let's let's hear your story, uh, sir. Uh, tell everybody, you know, a bit about your background. What is it that you do? And also, uh, you know, how you got into this amazing world that we both work in. You know, this the, the world of the quantum and how we you ended up learning yeah reading yourself yeah i think my story is similar to others in the way that they sort of found it by accident um mm -hmm. my story actually begins really long long before i had developed any autoimmune condition so mm -hmm. when i moved from kansas where i'm from originally uh to salt lake city utah that was a pretty stressful move it was sort of during my adolescence 13 14 starting high school here in the US or junior high, kind of end of junior high. So sort of that very vulnerable developmental part of a child's life and sort of losing that friend group and moving to a place that is a huge culture shock if people aren't aware of what Utah is like. It's a little less so now, but it's very much LDS, Mormon, highly like religious um, mm. sort of setting. And so coming from none of that, basically, I don't come from a very religious family. Um, maybe spiritual, but not like we didn't really go to church or anything like that to go into somewhere where it's highly religious sect of sort of Christianity, but also sort of fringe to where it's like bordering. I don't understand what's happening and sort of being thrown into that at such a vulnerable age was really hard on me. And that's sort of where I developed a lot of um, mental health issues around anxiety, um, OCD sort of started propping up and just sort of this general sense mm -hmm. of feeling like I don't belong. I had friends, but they weren't really close friends and I had never really regained that sort of community aspect that I had before. And as we'll talk about later, community is such an important part of healing and just development yeah. and just being a human. And so when you lose that, um, it can be really devastating. And so years after that, things were going kind of good, um, got into my first real relationship. And then that sort of went up in flames to make a story short. And that kind of just sent me into this spiral of like, ah, like, what can I do with my life? I just put all this energy into the, the love of my life when I'm 17. <laughs> and, um, and so I decided to get into health and fitness. I wanted, I was like, what can I control? Well, I can control like, you know, how I feel, how I look, blah, blah, blah. And I sort of developed um, uh, 
I actually developed anorexia from that, this mentality and orthorexia. So this idea of being obsessed with perfection, uh, being healthy, that sort of thing. And kind of as soon as I got into it, the next thing I know, it's been probably a year and I'm like 88 pounds now. And I'm wow. five foot nine. So that's pretty considerably that's underweight. Pretty yeah. um, and I only mention this because this is probably the beginning of what set my physiology up for uh, systemic failure because up until that point, I never was a particularly unhealthy kid. We didn't eat amazing by the standards of like what I know now. Like we definitely bought into the standard American version of health, which is like seed oils, lots of, I can't believe it's not butter, butter, ate red meat, but not tons of red meat. Um, didn't avoid red meat per se, but we definitely had like processed food. Like I was a soda junkie as a kid. I would literally on my way to my internship in high school, drive through Arby's and get a large Mountain Dew. And I did it so often, they just knew who I was before I even spoke at the drive-in. So I was very much, you know, went out to lunch every day, but I always had uh, what I thought of as a decent metabolism. I never gained weight. Um, I was always pretty slender, but I was also a very active outdoorsy kid. Spent a lot of my youth outside in nature, like catching bugs, like kind of standard boy yeah. things. And I never really connected that as to a reason why I wasn't developing sort of chronic health issues that I saw within other friend groups of mine or like gaining weight or becoming, you know, fatter over time. I just had none of those issues. And I do now kind of relate that to the idea of light as being one of the predominant uh, sources of health, because I always embraced the outdoors throughout my entire youth. Um, but after my anorexia, that's when things sort of started to change. Uh, I, over a period of years, I was underweight for probably a good two years, like under a hundred pounds. Well, maybe a year under 100 pounds and then still underweight for a while. Um, but when I regained weight, I moved to L.A., which was, again, another sort of cultural shock shift to me, kind of going from extremely conservative to like insanely liberal yes. <laughs> like community. <laughs> um, and then just like tons and tons of people, huge population density, huge amounts of EMF. Like, And I became an editor, so a video editor. So my days of being outdoors uh, we're pretty much done. I spent like 90% of my day inside editing videos uh, for YouTube, stuff like that. Um, and I also was pursuing acting and my manager did not want me to get a tan because that would change my look throughout the season. I needed uh -huh. to look consistent for audition sake and uh, sake of like what my photos looked like. So I did avoid the sun, kind of like the plague, not because I liked to, but because I didn't want to get tan and like look different than in my photos for casting mm -hmm. agents. So this is when my health really got bad. So I was doing pretty good. I still was sort of continuing eating dis disorder behavior, um, like over-exercising and things like that, but I wasn't underweight anymore uh, from a physical point of view. But by then my hormones, I'm sure were crashed. I was chronically fatigued all the time. I would crash by about 4 p.m. every day and like literally be in bed by eight because I was just wow. so exhausted that I would just fall asleep. Um, and, and I, there were a couple of times where I was walking back to my apartment from parking my car and I'd fall asleep standing up and I'd like collapse almost. And I, and I'd like wake up and catch myself. Um, but, but I, I, I always looked at this as I need more carbs. So I was kind of eating a standard bodybuilding style diet of like crap tons of oatmeal with crap tons of egg whites and like one egg avoided red meat, ate tons of chicken, tons of like white rice, like tons of broccoli and vegetables and crap like that and tons of protein powder and tons of tuna, which we'll come back to later in yeah. the story. Wow. Um, but um, when I was 23 in 2019, I was sitting in my apartment. I was watching anime and playing a video game called RuneScape at the same time because that's kind of how I unwinded at night. Um, and my right hand started tingling. And I sort of figured it was carpal tunnel-ish syndrome uh, just based on my job and just kind of what I was doing. Like I literally was like hand on a mouse. Um, and so I didn't really freak out, but texted my friend. We went and got a brace at Walgreens the other day. And then within a week, it actually spread to my other hand. And so this was like, okay, kind of weird. Like now I have carpal tunnel in both hands. Like that kind of sucks. So I got a second brace. So now I'm working with like two braces. Well, that's when I took a trip home to visit some family. And I noticed one morning I woke up and my entire spinal column was on fire like just burning. So like if you've ever burned your hand on a match or a pan or a lighter, yeah. it felt like that, but only on the spinal column, but all the way from the base of my neck to the tailbone. So it was the entire way down. It wasn't just 
one area of the back where like if you slip a disc it's like you got sciatica and then you have like pain maybe in the lumbar region this was like the whole spine isolated to the spine so i went to urgent care um and saw my gp and he like tapped on my spine it hurt uh he's like ah oh, you probably pinched some nerves blah 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 mm-hmm. took an x-ray saw nothing he was like yeah just go home and rest for a couple weeks and i just at this point i started thinking this is kind of weird because i had gotten carpal tunnel in two hands um which I sort of confirmed with like making sure it wasn't my neck by like doing things like this to pinch the nerve off at the end to see if you have it. Um, and he did that test too. But, but now I was like, okay. So I just kind of went on with my life. I was like ice in my back. I was heating it. I was trying to take it easy. Um, and then I started noticing tingling kind of appear everywhere over the next couple of weeks. So this is like from mid July to early August, 2019, like all these things occur. So a matter of a month. And then I'm tingling in my feet now, going up my leg. I'm noticing on the back of my head, the back of my neck. Um, and I think I started digging into the Google now because I'm like, okay, something crazy is going on. So I started yeah. digging into this research and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have multiple sclerosis. I have MS. Yeah. Like That's what I thought. So I went to urgent care and um, saw another doctor because um, it was just so hard to get appointments with normal GP. Um, went in and I was like, hey, like, could it be this? And they're like, well... You know, we do see people with younger ages having these weird symptoms and it is MS. So let's get you a brain MRI just to rule it out. And I'm like, yes, okay, sweet. We're doing something. Um, Did the brain MRI clear? I kind of wish I got to see the scan just to see like some of what the, because you can actually see deuterium shadows in MRIs. And now I would have loved to look at that and retrospect now knowing what deuterium is and been like, oh, I probably have all this crap just like build up in my tissue everywhere. But Mm -hmm. so that was sort of a, a dud. Go back to LA. I get a cervical spine MRI. Over the next like month or so, I kind of get the whole spine just to like look at everything and I'm fine. Like, um, nothing's crazy. And then, um, test, uh, for things like neuropathy with an EMG, which is like electromagnetic stimulation. They just put needles in you and they send signals through your peripheral nerves to see like, okay, is the velocity what we would consider normal nerve health? All that came back normal. I literally was told you do not have anything. You have no neuropathy, blah, blah, blah. This is where I discover something called small fiber neuropathy in my Google searches, and I kind of go back and I'm like, hey, can we do this uh, skin punch biopsy test? Because small fiber neuropathy is the sensory nerves in kind of the tips of your skin. You will not get a positive EMG or NCS nerve conduction study with that. So you need to actually look at what the nerve fibers look like under a microscope. Usually you can get this done by a dermatologist because they do that to look at like melanomas and things like that too. And they can see the nerve fibers. Um, but they did that and it did come back positive in three areas, wrist, hip, and foot, which are kind of the normal punch areas. They, they take a look at your skin. And now this began the journey of how did I get small fiber neuropathy? Exactly. Now, immediately when I got symptoms and I knew it was not this normal, like, okay, my job is causing this issue. I kind of had the idea of, shoot, this is my anorexic behavior coming back to bite me of years of chronic stress and over-exercising and burning myself out. Cause I, I already felt burnt out. Like I knew I wasn't healthy. I just didn't know how to fix it. And so, um, that's when I started thinking, okay, maybe I need to eat more. Maybe I need to like actually take a seat back and like maybe even gain weight. Like, I don't know. So I kind of tried that, but I also had the thought of, man, you know, I'm looking at my fitness pal here and I've eaten tuna every day for four years at least five to six ounces of tuna every day for four years so this is around september october 2019 i go back to my gp and i'm like hey can we like do a heavy metal panel i've eaten like a lot of tuna and he wasn't really keen on it mostly because i don't think he believed me but i showed him my fitness pal and i was like hey it's like you know what all right we'll do it to ease your mind blah 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 i had a great doctor in the fact that he kind of did what i wanted even though he didn't understand jack Yeah, that's pretty good but i'll take it (laughs) <laughs> but it came back and this was three or so months after I have seceded any seafood consumption because I thought that might be an issue in the beginning. So I just stopped this three months after now, normally what would happen with heavy metals is it doesn't want to be around in the blood. That's where it causes a lot of damage. So it'll shove it into some sort of tissue, particularly like adipose tissue and stuff like that. Well, I'm not a particularly adipose full guy, so I'm pretty lean. So I had a feeling that this was going directly to damaging tissues or organs or systems. So 
What was interesting is when we did my blood test months after I stopped eating fish, my mercury levels were still above the top of the range, which is, and wow. he was, I actually got a call from a nurse at the hospital that did the test. And she was like, yeah, we don't really know what to do about this, but it's bad. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. So now I got something to go off of is what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, and that's when um, I still sort of was in the centralized system. I ended up in December, January, going to Boston, Massachusetts to see um, Ann Oaklander, who's sort of the premier small fiber neuropathy research lady. She's actually one who discovered that 50% of people with fibromyalgia actually have some level of small fiber neuropathy mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. causing the pain. Now that's not the cause, but it's causing the pain is yeah. the nerve loss. Anyway, when they're complete shit show, um, spent thousands of dollars, saw the best of the best. And it was like, they were like shocked that I could still function. Yeah. <laughs> and they were just like, well, just go home and like, here's some drugs. And I was like, thanks. And that's basically when I quit centralized medicine forever. Yeah. I was just like, you know, I'm not going to get anything. Um, and so that's sort of when I went the holistic route, but that's sort of like the story in a nutshell. I wow. did get one answer, TSHDS, small fiber neuropathy. So I had an autoimmune marker come back mm. from that visit. But after that, I was like, they don't know what to do with autoimmune disease. So right. I'm out. But that was sort of my story. And I felt like I actually got through that phase of like trying to figure shit out in a normal centralized system and yeah. quitting it faster than most people. So mm. I am thankful for that because some people spend that 10 years trying to mess with doctors. Absolutely. And and just, I mean, I mean, I've been in practice for quite a number of years. And, and even if I think back, you know, 10 years, our understanding of autoimmune conditions was, was poorer than it is potentially today and in and, and that's just within the centralized system that i was in at that point mm -hmm. as a dietitian and you're quite right i would be seeing patients with fibromyalgia or you know inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatoid arthritis or any of the 80 yeah. plus autoimmune conditions that we know of and there could well be a lot more and many of those patients had been suffering for decades uh, because prior to that, there was even less understanding. And most of them were on a plethora of, I thought you were going to say at one point that your GP was going to, when they said everything was all clear, they were going to send you off to the, the psych department <laughs> and push you down. You know, I was prescribed Lexapro, oh, which I had okay. been on before and I never liked it. So, mm. but that takes so long to kick in that yeah. they actually i was having panic attacks like there was weeks where wow. i didn't sleep at all because i actually would go to bed okay. and my arms would spasm so they'd actually mm -hmm. shake uncontrollably and so they gave me clonopin uh benzodiazepine mm -hmm. to settle me down and i was on that for a month and then i started reading about it. i was like this is some bad shit so mm -hmm. i was like i quit i weaned off it but i quit and that's pretty lucky because yeah. if i had stayed on it longer it would have been so it would have done so much more damage to brain chemistry so i sort of lucked out but I knew I wasn't crazy, even though and th and that's sort of where I learned like the, the, the faults within modern medicine. And it's a lot like it's actually makes me question the level of education some physicians even have or use uh, because actually, there's yeah. almost zero, zero critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Zero. Yeah. yeah. Everything yeah. is down to a kind of a, I guess, a kind of a smorgasbord of, of symptoms. And then each one leads to a. A particular drug that yeah it's an algorithmic it's medical an algorithmic practice practice. and it's and it's and it's so sad because again to reflect on my kind of practice you know when i would see some of these patients coming in at the time i knew nothing about what we're going to talk about obviously the kind of uh you know, the quantum biological angle and even functional medicine i had trained at the time and even though that's got its massive shortcomings the these patients would be on 10 plus medications, you know, selection of different antidepressant or antipsychotic medications. They'd be on pain relief. They, you know, they would be on uh, benzodiazepines, whatever it would be to try and just exist. But most yeah. of them were not existing. They were in this kind of sort of floating state where they were neither here nor there. And what, what, what honestly, when those sorts of patients would come in, I'd be thinking as a dietitian, what the heck can I do? You know, at this point, there is there is so little. So, wow, man, that's that's uh, that's that's unbelievable. Um, so, with this with this in mind, you've now got this diagnosis. Let's talk about what happened next. You you quit the centralized system, and I'm sure many people here listening in will be able to resonate with, it, with your story, where they just just got sick and tired of, of what's yeah. been living with them. What did you do next? What was the next step? Yeah. So 
I was pretty quick into what became one of my fundamental beliefs around health, um, and that's mitochondrial health being the center of mm. most disease states. I came upon a autoimmune doctor who was a real, like real life MD in the fall when I thought I had MS named Terry Walls. Oh, and yes. I got her book probably around that time. I don't know if I had read it yet, but when I quit going to sort of just mainstream physicians, I read her book and that really opened my eyes to this idea of not just MS, but maybe all autoimmune conditions being related to the health of our mitochondria. Mm -hmm. And now it's funny because we, we spoke to Terry recently and that was a fun conversation, but it's interesting to see how I've, I don't know, this probably isn't the right word, but how I've transcended my thought from like, okay, the thing that affects mitochondria the most is like food and it's like sleep and it's like doing movement correctly, where now I'm looking at it in more of like a quantum lens. And there's just so much we don't even know about that. That's like, we're just scratching the surface. But I read that book and it really gave me, gave me hope, but it also gave me an idea of they don't know the whole story. So I need to figure this out for myself because I'm going to be the only one that cares enough to figure it out. And I worked with a few functional practitioners that sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and that's because I really went into them with the expectation of they're the functional expert. They're going to give me the weird tests. I've done them all, all the weird ones, yeah. all the like organic acids, all this stuff. And there's, there's, there's validity to, there's yeah. value to some of them. Yeah, um, totally. But the more and more I've gone through, it's like, I, I read into it less than, than I'd probably, than they do for, for like creating action steps. But I, I did all that and I just never got the level of um, individual work that I wanted. It felt like even though I was within a functional space, and I even worked with Terry Walls for six months and she was great. But it was still very like generic and sort of cookie cutter approach of like, um, and Terry didn't do this, but my first functional doctor did where he just like, okay, got all these tests, kind of explained what they meant, but definitely used words to make him sound smarter. <laughs> um, and then gave me like a like $300 worth of supplements that I had to pay for on top of the thousand dollars or a couple thousand dollars I paid to work with him plus the tests. So I was already a couple grand in here. And I was just looking at them. I didn't even take all of them because I was looking at these and I was like, what? Like, I just like, they're doing the same thing to me that my doctors wanted to do, just yeah. not with a prescription drug. Exactly. exactly. And so I didn't see what was different. And I eventually worked with um, uh, a, a decent neurologist who's also a functional neurologist, but he's a board certified that worked with Terry Walls too. Um, and he, I worked with him for a year, $10,000 did a crap ton of testing and I learned some things. I learned that my testosterone was completely plummeted. Like it was like, mm -hmm. like my total testosterone was like, it was, it was basically like crash. Like I'm like an 80 year old. Um, and my free tea was terrible too. And he, his solutions for me were the same story. It was like, you're going to go on T replacement, like oh bioidentical goodness. hormones at 25 at this point, 25. Exactly. You should be thriving. And so I was confused because it's like, I'm coming to these doctors to find the root cause, oh, yes. but they're, they're giving me a shot <laughs> to, and they're like, yeah, you'll probably just be on this the rest of your life. And I'm like, you know, I don't think that's normal at 25. No, and I started talking to people about it. I actually went to my, uh, the guy that owned my gym that I would go to. And he was like, yeah, I was talking to him about like, just what happened in getting T replacement. And he was like, yeah, when I was 19, I had to go on it. And I was like, dude, and you're not like questioning why that's that like you're a normal healthy like what i was from visual like there's no reason like there's something wrong if like you're going on t and so he had me on t he had me on thyroid um and what the funny part was even after replacement therapy my testosterone didn't even go up it went up minutely and everyone was shocked i actually went and saw just a normal board uh, endocrinologist like one of the better ones at my clinic and he was shocked like they were giving me like they're pumping me full of testosterone like shots every week every week like a pretty high dose like and there and it would like not go up it would i wouldn't break like 300 uh total t my goodness and so i just was like okay before this ruins my ability to make testosterone 
I'm going to quit and just figure it out. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, and I did. And that's sort of where I came upon at that point, like animal based diets was what I was really into at this point in my phase. I was very much after reading Terry Wall's book, like did her diet for like six, seven months. I kind of energy was back, but I'm not really feeling great. And then I'm kind of getting into the anti-nutrient space now of like, wow, maybe I shouldn't be eating like 50 vegetables a day in mountains like i was just having mountains of like collard greens and like kale and like all this stuff and i was eating organ meats and stuff like that now so that was that was a new to me yeah um eating grass-fed red meat again um but then i sort of discovered carnivore i met a friend of mine named ben that's sort of been alongside me the last like couple years and we would troubleshoot things all the time and he was carnivore for his autoimmune condition called cidp which is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy it's basically MS without lesions. It's like mm. the myelin sheath around your nerves is being destroyed in the periphery. Whereas in MS, it's the myelin in your brainstem and like your, your cervical spine where lesions are destroying myelin. So it's similar, but different, similar symptoms, but he did carnivore and saw massive success. And so I was like, Hey, you know, we're going to go into this thing. Started watching Paul Saladino, read his book when he was still carnivore and did that. And that's where I started like, actually like things started happening. Um, and then now we're kind of getting into 2021 where I met uh, Liv Vitae or Ryan yeah. Carter. Ryan Carter yeah. and, and I was like, you know, this guy I can relate to. I was going to take one more stab at coaching because I was still like not feeling the bomb. And I was like still trying to figure out my body. And this guy had dealt with an eating disorder himself before. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I was like, you know, maybe he can connect with me on a level that no one else can understand. Because mm. I had several functional doctors even dismiss my eating disorder background like right. i even went into an appointment with my mom and the doctor was like well on this new diet he may lose some weight but don't worry about it and i'm like you don't tell that to a no. former eating disorder patient <laughs> you don't tell someone that um <laughs> oh. but um but uh uh yeah so that's when i started working with ryan and he introduced me to light as being a fundamental uh base to health and i even working with him, I don't know. I think he, I don't think I really grasped the biochemical goings on or the physics, the biophysics. But I I learned like, okay, this is actually important. Like, I got a red light. This is the red light I bought when I was working with him like two years ago. Firewave just from EMR Tech. I got a bigger one now, but this is like sort of like the on the go one. I use it when I do pods inside just to balance out the light. But he was the guy that really got me into this idea of like, oh, light is so fundamental to mitochondrial health that. Mm -hmm. I can fuck it up every other way if I'm not paying attention to light. And that's where stuff really started happening for me. Like testosterone recovered to like, um, I would, I would say like pretty optimal levels. I, they probably could have been a little better, but for my circumstance, I think really good. Like I seven X it in wow. like six months, um, by myself. Like, I mean, he was helping me, but I was doing the work. Um, and that's when like stuff started happening. I saw a sort of regression of my own symptoms, like thyroid uh, recovery, um, like movement became easier. Energy has been fire ever since. And sort of that's what's brought me to today, just continually um, working with those principles. Incredible, incredible. And yeah, and uh, Ryan, I think he's now moved full time, I think, to Nicaragua. But yep. um, he, he yep. certainly did was or is registered in harley street where obviously we're based in yeah. central london which is which is pretty cool actually to have a, another quantum uh very you know, cool prodigy next next to us um <laughs> which, is, which is which is sweet but um yeah I, I, it's just it's just incredible i mean whenever i hear these stories from not just yourself but anybody um who's healed themselves through the through the quantum uh you know angle as it were when the centralized system has failed them it really just shows how logical this entire approach is because everything you're saying when whenever we speak to our, our men who come into us at Miller and Everton when we tell them the story about this fundamental requirement for light water and magnetism mm. there's there's no doubt about it that when you think about it from a, a human ancestry perspective it, it just totally makes sense how could you possibly question that light has not been fundamental to the shaping of human existence we've lived outside for most of our mm -hmm. existence prior to actually coming indoors and even then it was in caves or uh, some sort of makeshift yeah. shelter. How can we possibly not think that this is not important and that moving inside and living under artificial lights all day is not, is not an issue. And similarly with obviously the changes in temperature, et cetera, which we can get into. Um, but let's just, um, let's take a step back uh, if you don't mind, uh, Ryan, and just talk about, um, the, uh, 
the aspect of the mitochondria, which obviously you discovered through Dr. Walls and the Walls Protocol, which obviously I think is, is her original book. And let's think about that in the context of autoimmune disease. If you were to kind of do a Google search, which obviously you obviously did, you're a prolific Googler, and probably many people have who have an autoimmune disease, and they actually look and they go to some of the major institutions like, you know, John Hopkins or Mayo Clinic or some of these other ones that are talking about autoimmune conditions all the time. What they will say is the etiology of an autoimmune condition is that we don't know, basically. We don't know how they, they come. They just seem to come from nowhere. And yet it is certain, certainly to me, it's plain that there was certainly not the amount of autoimmune conditions for sure in the distant past. And maybe they were non-existent. And they, they don't, I don't know, I could be corrected here, but I don't think that they exist amongst uh, modern day hunter-gatherers either, to be honest. Um, I, I certainly haven't, haven't come across that literature at all. I could be, could be corrected here. So people like the hunter. But um, what do you, what do you think then is where everything is going wrong at this fundamental level to start an autoimmune condition where these centralized institutions don't have no clue. Yeah, it's funny because you'll see the ads on TV, at least here in the US and, and New Zealand, I think are the two countries that advertise lots of pharmaceuticals. You'll really? see the ads on TV for like Humira or something where it's like, yeah. RA is where the body mistakenly attacks the joints. And, and it's such a farce because <laughs> what I've fundamentally become to understand is that the, the nature doesn't make mistakes. Your no. biology is, is reacting accordingly. And it's our prefrontal lobes that make us who we are. Um, they are getting in the way. And I actually sort of knew this about myself already where I knew I was sabotaging my own success from anorexia recovery for potentially even years. Um, and so I was already a parent of, of my, like I, I knew I was in the driver's seat for this, even though, because I don't, I, I didn't have that same, a lot of people with autoimmune disease have a story of like, oh, my mother had this or my grandmother had that. Um, and now I have it, or yeah. even the same with mental illness. And I was the first kid in my entire family that we can go back. We have a pretty strong, like family history that we are uh, aware of, of like, no one else had an eating disorder. No one else like has had an autoimmune disease, like lots of heart disease, lots yeah. of like sort of stereotypical, like uh, paleolithic diseases, but, um, no autoimmune, no eating disorders, no like histories of insane mental health, like anxieties. And that's where I was, I started thinking this idea was given to me in, in uh, Wall's book of this idea of the environment we live in being the cause of, I would argue almost 99% of all disease that we see on a high level in society today. Um, and at this point, you know, I still was pretty food focused. So I was like into the idea of like, oh, it's, it's like glyphosate in our, in our wheat and like in our spray on all our foods, it's the antibiotics like that we're given as children. It's, um, it's like maybe even things like jabs and stuff like that as being like somewhat, I don't know, you know I mean? I'm, I'm just starting to think of like everything we're doing is wrong. And like, once I kind of got that light piece of like, oh, we're isolating wavelengths that were never meant to be isolated. And when you look at the studies around UV light, like they're isolating UV light and doing tests on albino rats that have completely different circadian cycles than us. And they're saying it causes melanoma and it's not even closely the same. And the most dangerous type of melanoma is caused by lack of sun for some reason. And yet it appears in areas where you don't get any sun. And so I'm making all these connections to standard of care, um, pieces of advice as not making any sense. It started with the food pyramid for me, but it ended with um, us being electromagnetic beings at the fundamental of it. And it's everything that's encompassing that I think causes the problem. The, the root, I think, always goes back to inappropriate inputs creating inappropriate outputs because that's sort of how we function. It's like input output system, like light is information. We intake that through our eyes, our skin, um, photoreceptors, and then that is turned into energy information and we're getting improper information like all the time. And that's screwing our biology up. Like you don't have to teach a monkey how to survive in the wild or what it needs to thrive. I watch my cat all the time, go outside, sunbathe, like sit in front of my red light, like get red light. It's really interesting. And like the minute I open the window, it's up on the window, like getting light. And so I'm watching these things happen and I'm realizing we are the only ones that are so removed from nature that we 
don't even know what to eat. We don't know how to move. We really don't know how to do anything. We're basically babies with yeah. like high IQs that can solve like crazy equations and build this tech that we don't even understand the downstream effects of on a mainstream level yet, other than now we're seeing it may be causing mental health problems, but they're totally not even tackling it the right way. But fundamentally, it's it's the environment as a whole that I think has driven the rise in autoimmune disease. I mean, I talked about this with Terry Walls about why are there so statistically so much more autoimmune disease and MS in particular, the further north you go mm -hmm. on the latitude scale. And that's because mm -hmm. there's less light less vitamin D. Um, people are inside more. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I think there's a lot of factors, but fundamentally, if we're going to like nitpick one, it's always going to go back to mitochondrial breakage. And I think disease just appears differently in people. And to me, it's less about why you got RA versus this person got neuropathy versus this person got MS and more about all three of you need to work on mitochondrial health in mm -hmm. order to fix those things. And that's why I think it gives me the confidence in being able to work with a variety of patients, not just someone with small fiber neuropathy, because on a fundamental level, we're all dealing with some level of mitochondrial dysfunction. We just need to fix what your environment looks like. That's the individual part. And so that's why I don't like to compare my journey to a client's journey, even if we're the same illness per se, because I guarantee you the way we got here is totally different stories. We live in different locations and we got to take those things into account. But I think that's just what centralized medicine doesn't miss. Like they have almost no funding into mitochondrial medicine at all. And so they're so mm -hmm. focused on RNA DNA that they're not going to, I don't see them figuring it out soon. And I don't see incentive structure to figure it out soon. I'm sort of, when I look at mainstream stuff, I'm a bit of a pessimist. I always think it's going to be like a patient led like decentralized led way of changing things. And I don't know if it'll ever become universal. It may just be like, we'll get 10% of all people to get this concept. And those are the people that we got to save instead of trying to yeah. save everybody. But yeah, I think that's kind of what fundamentally people miss. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's to kind of follow on your, your final point there about saving maybe a few i think it is about bringing people into the the light yeah. you know there are there are always going to i think with, with with the advancement of society and and all these factors like you said that the media is driving our consumerist behavior i'm not even sure if a lot of people want to leave that matrix to be honest and they and they want to to because sometimes it, it is to stay within yeah. that system um yeah. so that's 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 the sad part of it but that's that's been the case for your point around um these all these different autoimmune conditions have to, to further your point about the the kind of generational layers that you mentioned there where you didn't have this uh, her heritage of autoimmune conditions or anybody with similar problems that had in in the distant past again we're seeing similar things with the gentlemen that come into miller and everton we're seeing young men coming in uh with really really extensive autoimmune conditions and then we asked them about their family history like nope not a single yeah. person had, you know, inflammatory bowel disease. Not a single person had rheumatoid arthritis. Not a single person had this. These people are, again, 19, 20. This is not an age-related problem, as the centralized system would love to say. And it has no explanation for it. So that, that's that's really amazing. And and what I love is the fact that, you know, you're, you're, you're building this this individualized framework as we do for people to actually step mm -hmm. out and start to, to make these changes and, it, and it's and it's universal across um, all these different diseases so maybe let's um let's let's kind of go that way now that we've talked about the context and what we believe you know as two collectives that, that what causes all these problems let's talk about how do, how do we fix them you know from a mm -hmm. let's talk about what doesn't work because <laughs> you kind of set that up a little bit yeah there because Again, if you, if you, if you again, type in mitochondrial health, you know, into Google, you will almost certainly find some functional medicine, functional, you know. Yeah. Growth. Mitochondria gets thrown around a lot, oh, like yeah. pretty much everyone. I, and I think like there are supplements that are called like MitoQ, like they're supposed to like be for the mitochondria and stuff like that. Exactly. And, then, and, but it's funny because I'm sure you get this too, for people that reach out to you or come to see you, you ask them, okay, what I always ask people in a discovery call right away. I was like, okay, well, like what? What have you been trying mm. that maybe has worked and what hasn't worked? And yeah. almost all of them have worked with other people before coming to me, um, both centralized or functional yeah. or both. 
Um, and all of them have done lots of supplements. Maybe some of them are still on a bunch of supplements. They'll give me the list. Um, <laughs> they've done diet stuff too. A lot of them, even some of them going all the way to carnivore for a while. Um, and they're just seeing like, wow, this is not giving me the result that I want. And I have a real fundamental philosophy in the beginning of like, we need to remove inputs. Like I, I have sort of an opinion around Terry Walls that it wasn't necessarily what she added that did her the most benefit. It's what she took away. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's for the most people, it's like taking away the artificial light, taking away non-native EMF exposure, taking away processed food, seed oils, um, grounding more, taking away shoes, socks. So, and then it, it's just when at the end of the podcast, like people walk away from this, they'll be like, wow, this is so damn easy. And it is, it's like <laughs> extremely easy, but it's hard to be consistent and consistency is the yeah. only thing that leads to results. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I work with people for at least six months, usually depending on their background and severity of issues. Yeah. But I like to walk people through seasonality. I like to see them see two seasons so that I can tell them different realms of thought to take into those times of year and mm -hmm. where they're at. But um, I'm sorry, I totally like lapsed the question. I just went off on like a tangent, but it's like what they it's like what they got wrong and what works, right? Yeah. So I, what I, we I, get I, wrong is anything that is fundamentally not natural. So if you're supplementing yeah. anything you make endogenously. Vitamin D, melatonin, glutathione, superoxide dismutase, which I don't even know if people do, but sex hormones, you need to ask, okay, what is wrong with me physiologically to not produce these optimally? Mm -hmm. And that, sure, you might get a short-term benefit of that, but long-term you're causing a mismatch, especially with people taking lots of vitamin D in the winter. If you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you're basically saying, hey, body, it's summer, but it's also 20 degrees outside. Yeah. So 20 degrees Fahrenheit yeah. for, for <laughs> listeners. Um, but um. But um, I think a lot of people get supplementation wrong because they just jump into the protocols they see online, but they don't know how to apply them to their situation. Everyone's got sweet spots. It's sort of like when CBD came out and everyone thought that's like the best thing ever. And they're just taken. But now we're realizing, oh, different dosages work for different people. And like, it's not a uniform metric and all that stuff. But there are a few fundamentals that we can all take away that all of us need. They're all mitochondrial requirements. That is proper light rhythm proper amount of UV light, proper amount of red, infrared, um, even blue, but we got to make sure that that's not a naked wavelength that we're going into. We all need to be grounded. We need to be uptaking electrons like throughout the day. Um, we all need to be eating seasonally, preferably. Um, maybe you start at a different spot and build up to that, but that's ideally the goal because like this idea of creating an insanely diverse gut microbiome by eating a thousand different types of plants in a year actually makes zero sense. And actually when they've done these uh, research on like hunter gatherers, like the Hadza, they find that their biome is actually not very diverse and that's maybe okay to not yeah. be diverse. Yeah. Um, it actually maybe makes sense to only have a few hundred types of microbes in your gut. And um, Ben Azadi, who's a good keto carnivore guy, um, that I'm friends with, he did an experiment on carnivore where he, I think he was animal based keto before, um, but he did a, a microbiome diversity test prior and then after carnivore and his actually his diversity went up on carnivore. So, <laughs> exactly. so counterintuitive to any realm of thought. So I think a lot of stuff we, we talk about with your health, we just don't even know yet. Yeah. Um, there's also, but just to come in there, sorry, um, I don't want to no, uh, you're good. lose your thought, but um, uh, uh, this this idea of the kind of the gut microbiome and, and diversity is something that I covered with uh, Dr. Chafee, actually, when he came on. To oh, the, yeah, he's the great. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think people are, have been totally missold an, an idea here that the only way that you can change your gut microbiome is by eating differently. And as you say, eating thousands of different plants a week, I think is just totally untrue. It's, 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 it's a lie, frankly, because uh, interestingly to when they compared the Hadza to, I think it was a Dutch cohort, um, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a paper in nature that actually has looked to the DM, the alpha diversity. What they actually found was that the most important factors were things like where you lived, um, how much time you spent outside. Did you live with any pets in the house? Again, antibiotic use or mental health status. These were all more important factors in terms of microbiome diversity and diet and we know that mm -hmm. the diet it will shift the microbiome but within about seven to 14 days if you go back to a different you'll, you'll go back to your 
baseline level, as it were. Well, and, and think about it. And think about it. It's like we, we recycle the gut lining every like three to five days or something. It's like insane, the turnover. And the other thing that we know now is that not only can you stimulate diversity in the gut with food, but light actually does it itself. Okay. And so it begs the question, like, are we even looking at the most important factors? I think a lot of people talk about food because it's such a low barrier to entry to someone's mm -hmm. mind. We're all obsessed with food. We all love food. We all like cooking and or like eating food. I don't know anyone, even the anorexics, they deep down, we like eating food. Mm -hmm. I never hated food. I was just scared of food. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, it, but it's interesting because, um, you begin to realize like food and I, I hate that. I feel like I'm just stealing like Jackers like words right now, but, um, but like you, you do, you do find that like foods, like maybe the fourth, fifth, most important thing and like lights the first right. two or three. And it's, and I think a lot of things that affect people now that they don't even realize even within the functional sect, they like to split it off. And like, there's a seed oil crew, there's like carnivore vegans. And there's like people that talk about mold almost in isolation and then like heavy metal people. And then now we're realizing like, oh wait, mold exacerbates heavy metals. And that's exacerbated by X, Y, Z that you eat. And what they're missing is that within mold, one of the markers that comes back is low alpha MSH. And what does alpha MSH do? Well, it has to do with melanin. And what is melanin responsible or how does that come into being through UV light exposure? So we're missing this light component to the mold story that not a lot of mold people like to talk about. Um, and so it, it all comes back to light, really. I mean, even like our energy cycle, like ATP is like one third of what I consider what part of our energy and that's like the the food mechanism of like food energy and then there's electrons that we uptake straight up from the earth and then like uh with using light and like infrared light and stuff like that to actually stimulate you know things like mitochondrial water um which are all you know massively important to to this story so the the cool part is i don't think you need to worry about like the nuance i mean the nuances are there but you don't need to like, if you have a mold issue, like I have had, that was part of my story with the, like I had black mold in my bathroom, just didn't really know what to do with it mm -hmm. when I lived in LA. Um, and I, that was probably affecting me to some degree. Um, yeah. and you know, but, but now it's like, if you have that problem, like, it's like, you don't just need to myopically focus on the mold. We need to still get the whole picture. And, uh, Carrie Bennett has a really good philosophy of redox before detox. So it's like, we got to yes. work on the light stuff. And then we get to the other stuff because melanin, which we can maybe get into like a little bit. I'm definitely not the, yeah. the premier expert, but like we know melanin is a heavy metal sink. Like it literally will like collect heavy metals. And so if you don't have enough melanin in your body, you're actually more susceptible to heavy metal issues. So it's, it's fascinating how all these things end up coming together. And that's the way you have to view it. Like I had an intake the other day where I was like, you know what? The last thing I want you to do, or the only thing I really want you to take away from our intake here is like, stop focusing on your symptoms as being the problem. They're the mm -hmm. result of problems, but we need to get to the mitochondrial part. And once you've mastered those basics, then we'll maybe get a little more nitty gritty, but I don't even want to dive into any of the things like sodium channels or any of that stuff oh, until... Yeah, yeah, yeah you can master light water magnetism because you're just throwing poop at a dartboard otherwise. Yes. So yes. that's why I think it's so important. And that's why I think you don't necessarily have to have an insanely in-depth conversation always to right. get to the root of the problem because the practice shouldn't have to be something you methodically need to figure out. It should be returning to nature and biological um, expectation. You know what I mean? So I yeah, that's why I love it. I love it. The more you learn, the more simple everything is. Absolutely. And, and I think, again, to come back to what you were saying before, that the, the, the solution is very simple. I think the, the implementation I, for some, certainly some of the clients can be very, very challenging. That, yes. Sure, yeah. I think that's sure, where it gets nuanced. Sure. And so let's, let's assume that somebody is hearing this and they go, you know what, I'm going to give this woo woo a, 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 a go. You know, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try standing on the grass and, and grounding, you know, or, or in a park or on, on dirt. I'm going to try and get out in the sunshine every day. And I'm going to start to 
try to eat seasonally and maybe embrace the cold and the changing seasons a little bit more to try and get some of those changes to my mitochondria. And again, we've got loads of podcasts on these different aspects that you know, both both Ryan's podcast and, my, and our own. Yeah, we've, we've covered all these subjects in uh, in a lot of depth. If somebody was to do that and they have an autoimmune condition, just from your perspective, and again, we're not making any statements here about people's recovery necessarily, but it would be good to just get an idea from your perspective of how kind of soon you started to see changes when you started to implement these things. Could you could you maybe illustrate that a little bit? For... Yeah, I can sort of talk from the perspective of my own case and maybe yeah. just what I've seen with, with people I've worked with too, because it yeah. definitely varies. Yes. Like I think my recovery was slower but I also was slower to be consistent. Mm. Like I usually would kind of do one thing at a time and I'd get one thing down, but I'd kind of falter with like seeing sunrise every day and stuff like that. I easily made the mistakes of like turning the lights on or looking at my phone, like first thing in the morning, like for a long time. So mm. I made most of my, like my dramatic recovery happened over about eight months of doing all the things. Um, and it was sort of like subtle improvement. Like I, I wasn't, really i was so busy that i wasn't really paying as mindful of an attention as probably could have but i just was like would wake up one day and i'd be like oh that's not tingling like it was or yes. like the first thing for me always was energy like my energy just like it, all of a sudden i just was not tired at yeah. 4 p.m like i was fine yeah. and i wasn't drinking ca i had no caffeine anymore and i was fine and yeah. like all this so that was definitely first for me and usually what i'll see working with people is like energy comes back first mm -hmm. but it kind of makes sense when we think of energy issues preceding chronic health conditions for a lot of people um and then i but i've had clients who like i had a client who was 67 years old um who uh lived in santa barbara california had a, like a sort of an airbnb or not an airbnb but like a bed and breakfast situation and so she had a pretty good environment she wasn't like in the city um had that california weather um and she had already been carnivore for like 90 days before we met and she kind of hit a plateau with her pain and she had uh autoimmune uh small fiber as well mm -hmm. um or idiopathic idiopathic small fiber that's what it was um which just means they just don't know um and uh i helped her with a lot of the light stuff and just emf in her own house stuff and within three months she was doing pretty hot like she was out hiking again um pain levels were down and so i've seen pretty miraculous things like i've seen people with gut issues that have come to me with like like gut wrenching like killing over pain like they just gotta they have so bad ibs they just can't even yeah. work like in a week feel like they're 80 percent different so it, it's such a varied thing the key is give it i think you need to give something six months to really and and you need to be making sure you're doing it like every day Yes. for like an extended amount of time. And I say it this way too, the worse your zip code is, the harder you'll need to do these things and maybe the longer you'll need to do them. Meaning the more population dense you are, the more EMF you're exposed to, the more artificial light you're probably around. Um, depending on your work situation, if you work a nine to five, maybe you go to the office before the sun rises, like it's gonna be harder. I'm working with my dad and my brother with this stuff right now. They both go in before the sun's up every day. They're back before like the UV's gone right now. So on the weekends, what do we do? We're outside all day on the weekends because those are the only days they can really get in. And so you got to realize where you're at mm -hmm. and just be patient because even with me, there are areas of my health that I still know can be better. Um, it's more around like performance and just like recovery time and stuff like that, which is probably yeah. the best it's been in right recorded memory. But I know it could be better than it is. And I just need to give my body the right time and stimulus to get there. Because, you know, I do, I live in a suburb, like it's not the most ideal situation. So I'm like, when I can, I'm literally out there 80, 90% of the day, because I know I, I need it more than someone who's healthy and maybe lives in a tiny town with only one 5G tower. <laughs> so, so it's super context dependent on, on yeah. far as time, because a lot of people will come to you, I'm sure, and definitely come to me and they're like, so like, I should feel something after X amount of days. Right. And I usually tell them like, you know, I'd like you to, I believe you can, but I, no one can tell you it will. Like yeah. if yeah. someone does, then they're not telling you the full truth because you're doing the work. If you're doing the work, you know, I, I'd say the, the sky's the limit, but a lot of people falter, you know, and have like setbacks and that's totally part of the journey. It's just, mm -hmm. I think the most important part is when you have a setback, it's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. exactly. That makes the difference. 
because like it's like i haven't been perfect for two years but i've been pretty darn close i've definitely been consistent and that's where i think the distance is made up absolutely i, I agree and it's that word it's the consistency and everybody knows on a on a fundamental level whether they're actually doing the work mm-hmm. you say you know it's about being honest with yourself the worse your situation you know pain is a great motivator <laughs> whether it's psychological pain or physiological pain you know it's gonna be a great motivator to, to to make a change and if you've gone to the extent of seeking out different practitioners paying thousands of of of, of pounds or dollars or whatever it is to to get well then spending basically nothing in some cases to step outside be in the sunlight for 90 days or whatever it is to start to feel better i think is worth your time and investment it- and the- yeah. Oh no, I'm just and I was just gonna say, like, I'm saying this as someone that spent over twenty thousand dollars USD yeah. to improve, and maybe three thousand of it was worth it. Mm-hmm. Um and and most of the modalities I learned that were worth it were free slash close to free. Exactly. Like under a thousand dollars spent total, meaning like blue blocking glasses and red light device, under five hundred dollars for both. <laughs> So, so like the biggest things were nearly free. Um, the price for what I think of like either working with me or worth working with someone worthwhile is your paying to be educated in a way that is uh, individualized to you Absolutely. so that no matter where you're at in 10, 20 years, like physically or locationally, you'll know how to adjust because you know the fundamentals of what biology yeah. And biophysics require exactly. um so yeah and that's yeah. why like honestly i haven't written a course or anything because um and maybe i will but it's it's one of those things where it's like i feel like i don't want i want someone to buy a course that is like i don't know it's just like some of the so much of this stuff is like you might as well just like listen to the podcast and just get it like i don't need to make money off the and i just feels redundant so i just yeah. i just haven't gotten to the course mindset yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I think, but I think, to, to, again, just to pick up on one thing you said there about, um, you know, all these things can, can, can be costing very little or sometimes in some cases completely free. What we see a lot with some of the, the men that do come to Miller and Everton and they, and they do buy into this or they have already done some of it, like you said, they bought the red light panel, they bought the, the ice plunge. There is a temptation, I think. I don't know whether, again, I don't know whether it's a male thing, <laughs> whether we just like buying stuff <laughs> and, and like, you know, I get it. I, I'm a, I have a freaking, I have a freaking infrared sign right here. So I get, I get the, <laughs> I get the mentality. Yeah, I want to, it's this, it's this idea that it, this is not biohacking. This is not, this is not the Dave Asprey's, you know, Ben Greenfield, you know, no. buying, buying, buying a funny device just for the sake of buying a funny device and, and, and using it. This is getting back to nature. This is what we're trying to, to get through to people is that, and this is where the individualization can really make the difference because we've had guys come in who've got chronic autoimmune conditions and they're doing some of these the things. things. You know, they might, but they, they may be not doing the right one for them. You know, maybe they're mm-hmm. doing a load of cold plunging, but their haplotype is L. So they should be out getting infrared, you know, and vitamin and, yeah. you know, and the UV lights, you know, they, they're doing it completely wrong. You know, the, the, and so this is, and that's where it's like you got to have the at least the the level of innate intelligence to know yeah. like okay what applies to me and that's what i lacked for a long time was like yeah. i saw all these people doing these different things and it worked but i didn't know which one actually applied to my situation um and that's where you got to do some deep diving and even like things like trauma work i think can be valuable yeah. for people Absolutely. so super individualized totally totally yeah i'm on that point of trauma i mean we talked to dr ed caddy recently mm-hmm. um he's um again works with uh ryan from the Vite. and uh, again he's his background is an md and a psychiatrist but he actually does this somatic release work as well and, yeah and, and and obviously removing stored trauma that's within the muscle we've actually got a, a, a great very big we can listen to him so yeah i mean trauma your psychology is a whole angle we could spend another hour talking about uh, oh, yeah. and how that oh, plays yeah. into, into coherence in the body and, and the structured water but i want to round off this this amazing conversation just hand it back to ryan again to talk about you know what you what, what you're doing you know how can people work further with you you know how can they reach out you know how else can they listen to everything else that you've been you've been talking about um floor's yours my man 
Yeah. So me and my friend Tristan have a podcast called Decentralized Radio, where it's very similar to you guys. Talk to all the all the exciting people, all this sort of fringe research that doesn't get enough attention. And yeah. hopefully, you know, hopefully we can improve their funding over the next couple of years. Um, we just spoke to Dr. Jacob Lieberman about light. And we, that, that was sort of another rabbit hole around like healing trauma and stuff with like color therapy and various things. But we very similar conversations. You can find me on my website. It's www.ryanmitchellbrown.com. Now the Mitchell spelled with one L because I don't know, but that's just why it's it, normally Mitchell's two L's at the end, but this is just one. <laughs> but I'm also Ryan Mitchell Brown on Instagram. And the way um, I'm really focused right now on one-on-one -on -one, um, coaching and education and helping people that are really in dire straits, because that's the type of uh, care that I wish I had when I did a lot of my stuff. I ended up like, you end up being your biggest advocate and also your biggest like researcher, scientist, experimenter. Um, but I really want to hold people's hands through this process. So me and my friend Tristan also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's it's extremely in depth. Like we're writing plans that are freaking books for people, for people. Um, but we like to do like six months of coaching. There's continued education sessions. We do a lot of Q and A's, um, with clients, but it's totally individualized to you just because I, I can't, I think group coaching de definitely has valuable mm -hmm. points, especially for more intermediate adept and advanced uh, knowledge seekers. But mm -hmm. when you're really in the heat of it, you really want someone to talk to for that hour every other week or something like that. To just like, you know, one, get it off your chest, but two, just like, okay, like, what do I need to focus on that maybe I can't tell you in 10 minutes per person? So I really focused on the one-on-one -on -one to get uh, good results for people. And I've seen it over the last like year and a half. So that's kind of my thing right now. But yeah, I, I'm very active on Instagram. It's probably the best place to find me. Like obviously podcasts are everywhere, YouTube, Spotify, all that stuff. But yeah, Instagram is the best place to reach to me if you want to, if you want to talk or do anything. Awesome. That's, that's incredible. It's been an amazing uh, opportunity to talk to you today, Ryan. And thank you so much for sharing your story and your insights. And uh, yeah, everybody listening in, please check the guys out at Decentralized Radio. Contact Tristan and Ryan if you want more one-to-one -one attention. And I hope to have them back another again uh, another time. I'd love to. Thanks again.